Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Now this is my area of expertise and I became very interested in Sultan Abdul Hamid II. In Turkish we call him Ikinji Abdul Hamid, uh, which means Abdul Hamid al Thani in Arabic, which means the second Abdul Hamid. So there was one before that. Now the reason why Abdul Hamid is important is because Abdul Hamid has been exceptionally politicized. Okay, politicized on both sides. By Muslims, whoa, oh it's the internet. Is it keep? Trying to come back. There you go. Okay. And so what happens is in the historiography, which means in the narrative of Abdul Hamid, he was presented in a very negative light. And there's many writers who started to write about Abdul Hamid in this very negative context. And what they did is not only did they attack Abdul Hamid, but they attacked the institution of the Sultanate and they attacked the institution of the Caliphate or the Khilafah. And so Abdul Hamid came off quite badly there. Then what happens is Muslims try to respond to that. And so they write exceptionally positive things. That's also not helpful. Because when you do that, we're not getting the truth. And then when young people read books, they get confused. And that's not our objective. So one of the interesting things, let's do this. Don't worry about me using my hands. I, I do this at school, so I'll do it here. All right, so Muslims, they're interested in Sultan Abdul Hamid. In Western academia, they're interested in the the Hamidian period. It's intriguing. Muslims need heroes, they need idols, they need somebody to look up to. So in their history, they look at the person himself. They want to understand, is the person pious? Is he religious? Was he wrong? That's why he ended, that's his fault, blah, blah, blah. In the West, they're not interested in the person, in his piety, they don't care. They're interested in what he did. Okay, so they start dissecting, he did this, he did that, and so forth. For us as Muslims, we should actually be interested in both. What he did, and who he is. Of course we should. Now the challenge of Abdul Hamid II in reality is we know very little about him. He didn't write a biography in that sense. So what we do is we go on the very little information we have because Abdul Hamid was a recluse, a bit like me. So this is a picture of Shehzadeh Abdul Hamid II. This is when he was a, we would call a prince. One of the few photos of Abdul Hamid, there's not many photos. So all those pictures you see of Abdul Hamid, they're paintings. They're not photographs of him. He didn't want to be photographed. And so you see this one here, and you can see in his full uniform, he has a moustache and no beard, because the beard is you grow it when you become Khalifa. When you're Shehzada, you keep your moustache. And then when you become Khalifa, you grow your beard. It's, a, it's quite unique in that context. But one of the interesting things about Abdul Hamid II that I liked, um, was that Abdul Hamid II came into a period where the world was in flux. And Abdul Hamid was a reflection of that. Abdul Hamid liked the theater. Abdul Hamid liked reading about Sherlock Holmes. He got it translated. He loved Sherlock Holmes. He would say to his other, can you read Sherlock Holmes to me? Which is quite bizarre. Abdul Hamid II used to smoke cigarettes. People get shocked, they say, he smoked, he did. But Abdul Hamid II was very pious. Indeed, he was very religious. Abdul Hamid II was part of Tariqat and Abdul Hamid II, they say, slept virtually on many occasions four hours a day just to try to make the machinery work. Okay? Abdul Hamid was not supposed to be in power. Him coming to power was fortuitous. In 1876, this is going to be like a trick question when I put this out there, 1876, and it's called the Year of the Three Sultans. Do you know what year that is in the Hijri? Yeah. He killed us with the Hijri date. He killed us. Well, you should know the Hijri date, right? It's part of. It's, it is. It's 12. 91. Yeah, 12, 9, 12, 91. Yeah, yeah. And I explained this Hijri date. I, I always throw this in. I did this in my PhD, by the way. Initially, when I did my first draft of the PhD, I put the Hijri dates in, and the examiners all got confused. They go, what's he doing? Like, why are these dates in there? I said, these Islamic history, these are Islamic dates. They go, change it, put the Western dates in. I go, why? 
It's like we do it for Abbasid history, we do it for Umayyad history, but for Ottoman history, we go to the Western dates. It tells you something about how deeply we're becoming detached from our own culture, that we don't even know the dates anymore. All right? So, all right. In 1876, it's the year of the three sultans. What this means is that Sultan Abdul Aziz, who was the uncle of Sultan Abdul Hamid, was deposed. He was removed from power. And the reason why he was removed from power is because they wanted a constitutional caliphate. This is a unique idea of having a Khilafah system which is constitutional. And he wanted a parliament. Well, they wanted a parliament, right? And so what they did is initially they removed Abdul Aziz from power and they brought Murad in power to be the constitutional caliph. Legend has it that Abdul Aziz killed himself um, after being deposed, but it's very unlikely he did that. And the reason being is because both his wrists were slit. You can't do that. Once you slit one, the doctors here would know that you slit your wrist, you now can't hold a knife to slit the other wrist. It's impossible, right? So the chances are is that he was probably murdered because he was resisting the idea of having a constitutional caliphate because he wanted to be the absolute sultan. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay. So the question was, what's a constitutional caliphate? All right, so let's do this. So the Ottoman system was a, we call it a, nomocratic system, which means it was a system based on laws very similar to what we have in the United Kingdom. So you don't need, technically in Britain, a constitution. right? In Britain, the legal system is sufficient for the country to survive. In the United States of America, they have a constitution. And the way the Hamidian system worked, or the Ottoman system worked, okay, let me explain it to you like this. So I support Liverpool. Thank you very much. <laughs> I like him already. All right, we're going to win the league as well, so I'm kind of pleased. 30 years I waited. Okay, so Jurgen Klopp, let's just say Jurgen Klopp, he's not, but for argument's sake that Jurgen Klopp is Abdul Hamid II. Right? Jurgen Klopp. All right. And let's just say for argument's sake that the laws, the administration, are, is the football team. So Jurgen Klopp, he's the manager or the Khalifa. The football team are the rules, the laws, and what he has to administer. The fans are the Ummah. Where are the fans? We support Jurgen Klopp. But we don't pick who should be the manager of the Liverpool Football Club. That's not in our hands. We don't choose the manager. Who chooses the manager? There's a board. The board chooses the manager. We can make noise, say we're not happy, and the board can decide to remove the manager or not. They usually would remove the manager if he's not doing his job, meaning the team's not winning. If the team's losing, get him out of there. So if the Sharia is not being implemented properly, or society is not satisfied or happy, Get the caliph out. But how do you get the caliph out? How do you do that? That's where the challenge was. How do we have a system where we could remove the caliph from power? And so what they wanted was a document, a constitution of explaining to society what the role and job of the khalifa was in relation to society and in relation to the sharia. How does this work? And so what they did is they constructed this idea of having... They call it this, it's really interesting. It was the constitution, the constitutional caliphate, and then the caliph. One, two, three. The system was in that order. That's what they were trying to institutionalize. They have a constitution, the constitutional caliphate underneath, and then the khalifa is important. Now, this became very controversial. Because people said in the Qur'an, it says, Obey Allah, and obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you. How can you get a caliph and put him under a constitution? How is that even possible? And I'll explain that later, because this verse becomes quite interestingly contested over. They start to contest over this verse, right? So that's the system they wanted. They got it. And then they have a situation, because they say society is not ready for it. People are not ready for it. In the 19th century, for the first time, you start to see in Islamic discourse this idea of public opinion. Okay? The opinion of the public mattered for the first time. It, it did matter in the past, but they had people, representatives for them, that were sufficient to safeguard their interests. Now, with newspapers and so forth, the public, it was suggested, have a more increase uh, uh, interaction with the government. So now, there's a closer bond between those who are governing and those who are being governed. Right? Some people will argue that that's a European idea, that this never happened in Islamic history before. 
But in fact, what you're seeing is, you know, the zeitgeist at the time is everything is changing very quickly. The world is getting smaller and they're trying to centralize. In 1878, can you tell me the Hijri date on that? Oh, good point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Abdul Aziz is dead. Murad comes into power. And then what happens is Murad goes crazy, loses his mind. And so then they choose Abdul Hamid II. And the academics at the time said that Abdul Hamid was anti constitution. That's not necessarily true. When we look at the information, Abdul Hamid didn't actually have a problem with the constitution. He just felt that people were not ready. And so there was a difference in opinion. One of the biggest problems they had was the role of non Muslims in the Ottoman parliament. Can we have non Muslims in the Ottoman parliament or not? The parliament became like a, a council, and should non Muslims have the same weight of opinion as, non -Muslims, as Muslims? It became a contentious issue at this moment. And some ulama said, no, non Muslims cannot be in the Ottoman parliament, and other ulama said they can be. It's not a problem. Okay? Some ulama went as far as saying that non Muslims could be Grand Vizier. Right? They could even be that. But we won't let that happen because it's a Muslim entity. Now that might sound outrageous to some people, but understand how the, the domains is. It's a multi-ethnic domains. Bosnia, to Cairo, to Yemen, to Anatolia. It's huge. And there are many non-Muslims. And the argument that was made is that we should hear the opinions of non-Muslims regarding their communities, and we should hear the opinions of non-Muslims regarding what opinions and ideas they can give because they are also loyal to where they live. That sounds crazy, but Muslims are doing the same thing in the United Kingdom. They want to be heard. They want to be represented. They want to have representation. And the question is, in the opposite side of the coin, did Islam allow them that representation? It did. It did. But the Khalifa had to be Muslim, obviously. Sheikh al-Islam had to be Muslim. And the, the commander of the army had to be Muslim. The Grand Vizier could have been non-Muslim, but they said, we're not going to let that happen. So from the fiqh, it's interesting, from the fiqh point, they said this argument can be made. But from the practical point, we're not going to do that, because that would just be suicide. <coughs> and then, so they opened the parliament, they go to war with Russia, and Abdul Hamid said this parliament created chaos. It did nothing but create chaos for me. I couldn't make decisions. And what you see is now two decision-making processes. The first decision-making process, the idea is to have one strong leader, the buck stops with that person, and they make all the decisions. The second idea is to have a parliament, and there's more decision makers in the parliament. Which system works? The ulama came to the conclusion both of them are possible. So now you start to see a shift taking place in history, backwards and forwards, in terms of what type of political system they want. 78, Abdul Hamid says, goodbye. I'm out. I'm done with this. Don't have time for this madness. And so the constitutional experiment, it's gone. Okay? All right. We're all right so far. We're surviving. I'm not as interesting as Jonathan Brown, I know, but we try. We try. I like JB, actually. He's a nice guy. Uh, okay. So now, one of the main policies... Oh, let me show you some more photos. So this was the other photo of Sheikh Saadeh, Sultan Abdul Hamid. You can see that there. And that's him with a fez. Um, fezes were really interesting because when there was a... One of the things you see in the Ottoman period is what we call uh, clothing reform. Clothing, in that time, was a type of uniform. Okay, and it's interesting that in Islam they have the idea that you should look a particular way. So some of you are wearing hats, and it's an identity. It's a, it's, it's a marker of who you are, right? Um, so I wear round neck shirts, as you can see, to make a point that even in you know I'm a Muslim, in this sense. Yeah, when I went to Madrasa, we sometimes the collars were problematic, but some of our imams were right. So what you see here is that in the Ottoman context in the 19th century, globally, uniform was a marker of identity, and when it, when the Turkish Republic was formed and people were making the ulama take off their hats and so forth, it became really problematic because one of the ulama said, first you take off our clothes, then you take off what's in our minds. So it's interesting because before the hijab was attacked, the hats of the men were attacked first. You attack men first, then you get to the women. And the men's clothing was attacked 100 years ago. They, you can't see a single photo in this period with a man without a hat. I couldn't find one. Everybody's got their head covered, every single one. So it's unique. And when they tried to change the, the turban to the fez, it was also controversial. But they justified it by saying this came from Morocco. So in Turkey, they call Morocco fez. Okay, so it came from there. They said, we can deal with this. It's okay. This is Islamic. 
So what did Abdul Hamid do? He removed the visuality of the Sultan and he replaced it with the symbol of his Torah, his cipher, his signature. It's very unique what he did. He tried to control the symbols that represent him. Photographs are really powerful. When Abdul Hamid was using, when photographs came into the Muslim world at this time, they created what you would call memories for you. When you look at a picture and you can't remember what happened 20 years ago, you look at it, oh, I, oh yeah, I was like that. So people remind me of a pictures when I was slim, when I was younger, right? Um, but now when I look at it, oh, that's me. And you forget, you forget what you look like. So pictures were a way of constructing memory. It was really intri intriguing how in the Ottoman domains now they were using photographs to construct the memory for you. This is what Quds looks like. This is what Baghdad looks like. This is what India looks like. <coughs> Abdul Hamid was very interesting in the way he used photographs. Photographs of himself removed it. He didn't want people to worship him. What he did is he put this up. But this symbol became far more powerful than a photograph in itself. It's a very unique way of creating an imagination of people. People never saw you, but they saw your signature stamped in the wall. You walk down the street of Damascus, there's a fountain, stamp. And so you had an image of the Sultan, but you didn't see the Sultan. It's a way of trying to combine the modern and the new. I mean, and the tradition, in that sense, right? So his Torah is really fascinating. I remember when I was in Damascus, um, and I used to see the, the, the stamp of Abdul Hamid II, I thought, wow, that's amazing in that sense. And um, that's how he operated. And Abdul Hamid worked very hard to control the symbols that represented him. One of the unique things about Abdul Hamid is he understood symbolism. And the interesting thing about symbolism, to some degree, is symbolism is an indication of a weakness of intellectualism. Real religion, in, for the masses, the language that's used is symbolic language, or symbols, or images. It's easier for people to understand, but it's fluid at the same time. And so most people in societies at the time had particular forms of symbols. Because, you know, the idea of intellectualizing the society is quite hard. Okay? And what Abdul Hamid was good at is he figured out a way of con controlling these symbols. He would build mosques, tekkes, and so forth. And so you knew. They have a saying in Tur Turkey, which is devlet chalishur, meaning the state is working. Because you can always see something is being built. So you can't see the sultan, but you can see a hospital was built. Yes, the, the dollar is working. There's a mosque here. Yes, they're working. That's sufficient for us. And Abdul Hamid was good at that. All right. So oh, these are some of the cartoons. We'll go to that later. Um, so in the West, they, they, um, yeah, they did cartoons of Abdul Hamid in this context. And once again, cartoons are very powerful images. Okay? Because you don't have a photograph of this guy. Cartoons give you freedom to do whatever you want in that context, right? In this sense. Now, what Abdul Hamid focused on when he came into power then is what they call in the West <coughs> Pan Islamism, which actually the word we use is Ittihad Islam. A better translation, if we were going to use a translation, is Islamic unity or Muslim unity. But pan-Islamism became a loaded term. Pan-Islamism became a term that was quite dirty. Political Islam. And Abdul Hamid is using pan-Islamic pan policies. Well, what does that mean? I don't like that word. As an academic, I actually am one of the few who refuses to use it. I'll give you an example. So I say to my students, we give dawah, right? So yes, teacher, we give dawah. What if I translated dawah to Muslim missionary activity? How would you feel? And they get uncomfortable. That's not, that's not what we're doing. I say, yes, but what if the West said, that's what you're doing? How would you make sense of that? The point of language is this. There's a way that language is in, understood internally, and then there's a language that's imposed on you. Language is about power. This is the name given to you, this is the name you give yourself. It can be the same phenomena in terms of practice, but the way it's described is different. Right? I give dawah, Muslim missionary activity. Not working here. So words once again become important. They call it pan-Islamism, and it's interesting because it, pan-Islamism became Islamism, as we know, and that's how the roots are, and now Unfortunately, we're all Islamists, if we, <laughs> what you need to do. So, ittihad, 
Unity is what Abdul Hamid called for. And so his policy is now focused on a physical manifestation of Islam that can be seen within the Ottoman domains. Abdul Hamid had an interesting problem because he lost a lot of the Balkans, this section here. And so he, the only thing that was left was Turkey and the Arab provinces. What he did is he had this situation of Ummah. How does the Ummah work? You have Ummah in the domains. You have Ummah outside of the domains. And you have Ummah that have lands that have just been lost. What do I do now? So what you see in this period is even the idea of Ummah starts to become complicated in the minds of the Ottomans. Does Abdul Hamid as a caliph have any jurisdiction, any authority over Muslims outside of the domains? And this starts to become a debate, yes or no? Can he help Muslims outside the domains? And what should his help be? And then what should be the, the, the interesting question is, is what is the requirements for Muslims outside? So Muslims in India, what can they ask for? What can they ask for from the caliph who they don't live under? Can they say, give us A, B, C, D? And if he doesn't give it, is he a bad caliph? This is now the situation, right? So Muslims in India were colonized by the British. They wanted Abdul Hamid to send an army to take them out. He says, I can't do that. My army's first lot strong enough. The domains is really big. And I have to get through Iran. How's this going to work? But I can send you money. How's that? Now here, what happens is Muslims today become very, they start using today's morality to judge that past. And that, that was unacceptable. Why couldn't he do that? But here's the complexity. The domains are moving, and he has to make a sense of what it means in this sense. And so what he does is he uses these policies, he uses them very well. Internally, the first thing he does is new educational policies. Abdul Hamid felt that the madrasa was not sufficient to give an education to Muslims who wanted to study other subjects apart from ulum al -Din. Whereas in the past, the madrasa was sufficient to teach you math, science, and so forth. By the 19th century, engineering, translation, these sort of subjects became very difficult for the madrasa to deal with. The madrasa is also going through a flux. So you have one policy, trash the madrasa, build new schools. Reform the madrasa, or keep the madrasa and build new schools next to it. That's the policy we have. He couldn't trash the madrasa, obviously, he was never going to do that. He couldn't reform the madrasa, because if he reformed the madrasa, many conservative ulama were saying, what are you doing? Don't touch it. It's got nothing to do with you. It's intriguing here, another question. Does the Khalifa have the right to touch the madrasa? Or is the madrasa the jurisdiction of the ulama alone, and the waqs are the jurisdiction of the ulama alone, and the Khalifa can't touch it? Because it was waqf. The state was not paying for the madrasas, it was paid by society, communities and so forth. Because the argument is, is that the madrasa should always be independent from power. Because if it's not, power can manipulate the madrasa. Right? So now we had this system here. Right? People keep asking the question, well, where, why didn't the Ottomans tax people to raise the money? Why did they take loans from the West? The reason why they couldn't tax people, because the ulama said, you can't tax people like that. It's unfair. So where are they getting the money from? They can't tax people because people will complain that we're Muslim or non-Muslims. Why are you taxing us so high? What are you taxing us on? Where are you getting the money from? The zakat was not sufficient. And so now then, a bit of a bind. We need to reform our military. We need to do that. But how do we do that? Understand that when the West were creating their new technological tools, they were doing it with the help of colonialism. They go places, take stuff, make money, build. But the Ottomans couldn't do that. So when the British built trains, they didn't build trains because they wanted to move people so they could have a wonderful journey in India. They were moving slaves. They were moving soldiers. They were moving resources. That was their mindset. That's why we will build trains. Move it faster. When you're building new weapons, the reason why you're building weapons is to take out people quicker. So they started building new weapons. The Ottomans didn't have that mindset because that's not how they saw the world. The main crux in the Ottoman Empire at the time was the idea of justice. They weren't thinking of colonizing people. They were thinking of justice. How do you compete now with empires that are colonizing and using extreme violence? How do you adjust your policies? So the policy is, okay, we can take this from the West, but what do we do to it? Can we Islamize it? And that's another thing. And there's, this is not easy. I'll give an example, the clock. When the clock came into the Muslim world, it messed up the Muslim world. How's a clock mess up a Muslim world? You can, it's a clock, you have to tell the time, right? All right, the idea in the Muslim world was, I'll meet you after Salat al-Asr. 
What time is it? Asr time. <laughs> yeah? People are fluid. We'll go to work when? Whenever I want in the morning. We'll go. Off we go. Now, it's, we start work at 9, we finish at 5. There's a time. You're now controlling people with this clock. So the clock didn't only change the way we told the time, it changed our perception of time. Everything changed. I need to go here, here, fast, fast, clock, clock, clock. Interestingly enough, this hasn't succeeded in the Muslim world. People are still always late. <laughs> Even here. <laughs> we didn't totally get colonized. We're still late, yeah, alhamdulillah. You know? It, it's amazing because, you know, like when you see in the Muslim world, people don't stand in lines. You know, the colonizers, they put people in lines. Next, next, next. But now I get Muslims coming to Turkey and saying, but you should stand in lines. In Tesco, I stand in lines. Yes, I understand. In Tesco, you stand in lines. But understand that people not standing in lines was a form of resistance to some degree because they were being forced into these systems. And the Islamic society was far more fluid than that. So what I'm saying is tech is really interesting because it comes into the Muslim world and we don't think about it. The only question we ask, is it halal, is it haram? Does it agree with the aqidah of Islam or not? Yes, no. But actually, if you look at stuff, you should ask also, what's the philosophy behind this tech? Right? What's the philosophy? I'll give you some WhatsApp. I hate WhatsApp because like I live in Turkey. My mom sends me messages. She sees the blue ticks. I'm asleep. She wants me to answer now. And if I don't answer, she goes insane. And people can access me everywhere and anywhere around the world. Why should they have that access? But they want it. And so it's draining. Imagine how many people I know. What's up? What's up? Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to put the phone down. I'm out. But Muslims will say, but WhatsApp is halal. Of course it is. But the point is, is this. What space is it coming from? What space is Twitter coming from? Twitter is quite toxic. Understand how it operates. So what the Ottomans were doing now, go back to this long story, is education. What type of education can we give the young Muslim community or societies to the one hand that can compete with the West, but at the same time not attack our Islamic educational system? So they call it, we call it in English, the civil schools. Now here's the problem. In Western academia they used to call it the secular schools. It's problematic. What makes a school religious or secular? It's a school. What makes education secular or religious? They didn't have this term. You remember when I gave that triangle? And I said, the Islamic languages actually don't have a word for secular. It's not there, initially. Because we never saw the world like that. <coughs> Secularism is a European idea that then penetrates the rest of the world. And so then we have to create words. And then we're saying like, dunyawi, your dunyawi. What does that mean to be dunyawi? Does that actually mean? Or la diniya, or so forth. You don't have religion. So it's problematic. And so they call it civil schools, Western academics call it secular schools. But they want secular schools. We call them Nizamiya courts, the courts of system. They said these were secular courts. Okay, so language once again here. Now, the Ottomans are having challenges, of course, because they're trying to make sense of the, the world changing around them and how do they fit in. Abdul Hamid's main idea was to give you a basic education and insist on morality. Ethics and morality. Make sure all the Muslim students have good morals and values. Loyal to the Sultan. Wait, wait it's loyal to Islam. Yeah. <laughs> loyal to the Sultan. Loyal to your teacher. And then loyal to your parents. Make sure you have that mechanism taught to you. That you understand that as a Muslim you have this basic. They insisted that akhlaq and tarbiya were the most important thing before you can study anything. So the Muslim scholar in the Ottoman period, he said, before teaching Quran and Hadith, you should always teach Muslim students good manners. If they don't have good manners, they don't know how to interact with their culture. Right? So like I give an example. When I was going to the madrasa, we used to hold the Quran like that, right? to our heart. Don't remove it. And it was in a cloth. And then it was going to the highest place in the shelf. And if I was sleeping and my feet were towards it, my mom would... What are you doing? Well, today it's just a book. Let's just throw it around. And we can see in the, in the 19th century, it mattered to the Ottomans. Even this cultural thing is really unique. So, Abdul Hamid's idea was education. Some people will argue that is it the job of the caliph to decide people's education? Should that not be the job of the parents? What's going on here? Why has the leader decided what type of education people should get? 
Why has the leader decided the loyalty should be given to him from the educational system? So some people argue that the Ottoman educational system then was a reflection of modernization. That the state is making all the decisions for you. No freedom. And people feel loose. Okay, a little bit of a problem. And this is a debate that's still being had by Ottoman historians. Okay, what is the prerogatives of the Sultan? All right, you guys are surviving so far, right? Yeah, this. Okay, let's go. All right, so let me show you this. 1909, um, we have a revolution. And people always ask me, why is there a revolution against Sultan Abdul Hamid II? Shame on them. Shame on them. He was a pious sultan. He was a good sultan. This should never have happened. These people that did the revolution, so at the top it says uh, Yashasun Watan, Yashasun uh, Millet, Yashasun Hurriyet. Okay, so, oh yeah, it says it in French as well. All right, so it says, um, uh, long live uh, the Watan, long live the Millet, which is Milla, and long live Hurriya, Hurriyet, freedom. Now, once again, the reason why I'm reading these words to you is because you could translate them as long live the nation, long live the people, uh, or liberty, and long live uh, freedom, but they don't quite work. And this is unique. When the revolution happened, a lot of people argued that this revolution was inspired by the French Revolution. And so they're using French terms. And so westernization is happening again. But one of the things you must understand is our language, it has a different genealogy, meaning a different meaning. Horia doesn't necessarily subscribe to the same idea as Western freedom. So when this word Horia went out, how did the Muslims feel? What were they thinking? And it's interesting because Sheikh Rachid Rida says, you know, some people think Horia means not to pay taxes. So they're not paying taxes anymore. Because they understood it differently. Horia comes from the idea of being free as a, you're a slave and then you become free. Right? So these terms are really interesting. This is Enver Pasha, who was one of the people who uh, did the revolution, but why did the revolution happen? These people were students from these civil schools. So the very people that Abdul Hamid educated are the people that did a revolution against him. Why? It wasn't that Abdul Hamid was a bad sultan. Abdul Hamid was in power for 33 years. People got exhausted. New ideas new plans, the younger generation. It's like, you know when a father has a business and a young son or daughter says to their father, okay, give it to me now, he's going, you're not ready yet. But I'm ready, I've got a degree, you're not ready yet. But I'm qualified, you're not ready yet. Baba, please, not ready. And then the, the child just freaks out. I'm moving out, I'm getting mad to someone, goodbye. And so basically this is what's happening. This is a young generation that are seeing that while Abdul Hamid had maintained the Ottoman domains really well, but what was happening was they felt it was remaining static. It wasn't going beyond that. It wasn't moving. There's another one. You can see this one has an image of Sultan Abdul Hamid himself. Okay? And postcards are really powerful. So the French Revolution is freedom, equality, liberty. Okay? Hurriya, Musawa, Uhuwa. Yeah? And then what they do is you have more words. Meshferet, Adalet, Nizam. So you're seeing a fusion of Western ideas and indigenous Islamic ideas creating a hybrid of a new language, right? Um, and postcards were really interesting because they came from the outside. Okay, this is our Sultan 33 years later. Could you imagine the first picture you saw was a guy with a moustache, then you never saw a photo of him, and then when you saw a photo of him, that's what he looked like. People were like, whoa, he's gone old. It's like when I went to the mosque and someone said, you put on weight. Because he hadn't seen me for this long time, right? <laughs> so people, it's not like today, where you have photos everywhere, Instagram. So people never saw the Sultan. It was very rare. And then when they saw the Sultan, the imagination of him, the image of him shattered. Because that's what he looks like. You go, oh man, this guy's old, he's gone frail, what's going on? And they deliberately published this as a way of trying to discredit his credibility. Okay, to weaken him in that country. And this is where images are powerful. What's unique today, in the past they used photographs to create a memory. Today we use photographs to wipe out your memory. Just swipe, 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 swipe. You can't remember what the last photo is. Swipe, swipe. So you become so obsessed with what you're seeing, it's exhausting you. 
That's why I said Quran is amazing because it's for this. Okay, use it. Right. Here's our Ottoman Parliament, 1908. And the reason why I wanted to show this, uh, revolution happens in the Albanian provinces. What's interesting here is that when the revolution happens in the Albanian provinces, it's an indication that the province is just as important as the center. A lot of old Ottoman historians used to say province and periphery, meaning the edge. I don't use that term anymore. I say we had multiple centers. Baghdad was a center. Cairo was a center. Konya was a center. And Istanbul was a super center. Right? In that sense, like the domains were like, let's do it like this. They were like connected like this. Right? They're connected in various ways. It's not like your centralized state today. You have one capital. So for example, Baghdad, people get surprised when I say this, that when the Ottoman state collapsed, the Ottomans were far more traumatized at the loss of Baghdad than they were of the loss of the Hijaz. You say, why is that? Because Baghdad was the center of the Arab provinces. Lose Baghdad, we lost everything. And you can see in their works, they say, we lost the city of the Abbasid Caliphate. What happened? It was a shock to their system in this context. So they had multiple centers. And so what happens is a revolution happens from the Albanian provinces into Istanbul. And Istanbul listened. And I wanted to show you this photograph because Abdul Hamid goes, OK, constitution back. OK, you can have uh, the parliament open. And there's ulama in the parliament. There's members of the ulama in the parliament. And I wanted to show you that for this reason. Here we go. One of the ulama, Mustafa Sabri Effendi. Um, so, my next project is I'm working on Mustafa Sabri. I find him a very fascinating individual in this context. Uh, Mustafa Sabri said something really unique. He said, when the revolution in 1908 happened, he said, a revolution is what happens from the people. When the Turkish Republic revolution happened, he says, you can't call it a revolution because that happened from the state, top down. Revolutions are always bottom up. And when revolutions happened, it was really unique because they used the word inkilab. Okay, Kalaba. Now, when people heard this, they said, what does Inkilab mean? Inkilab was a word invented by the Ottomans themselves. Prior to that, you don't see it much in Arabic literature. The word they used was Thoda. And people got uncomfortable. Is this a Thoda? Is this, is this a revolt against the central government? Because historically, Muslims never revolted in, against the central government like that, right? What's unique about here, what you see in the Ottoman period, is that revolutions are the extreme form of negotiation with the government itself. There's people who are not being heard, they go to the street. The reason why I'm explaining this is because now in the so-called Arab Spring we have these notions, and it's important to understand it happened already, and the ulama justified it. And they justified it against the Khalifa. And Mustafa Sabri was one of them. Okay? There's another one. Al Malala Hamdi Yazar. Hamdi Yazar is, Effendi is in, interesting because he is the first person to translate the Quran into Turkish. And the Turkish translation you have in Turkey is only one translation, it's his, that's it. He didn't want to translate it, or maybe he did, it's controversial, but they kept his one. Okay? And the contestation now came on this verse Obey Allah, obey the Messenger, and those in authority from amongst you. What does this mean? Hamdi Yazar said there are two caveats in this verse. I'll explain this. For me, it's interesting. So he says, it says, the verse says, obey Allah. Done. Obey the messenger. Done. And then it says, and those. It doesn't say, and obey those. So that means there's a space here for disobedience. Yeah, it's unique. He explains this. He goes, there's a gap for disobedience because he doesn't say, and obey those. So the Sultan can't be an absolute authority. He can't be. And then he says, and those in authority, who are the authorities? Hamdi Yazar said, the authorities are not just the Khalifa. The authorities are all those people like the ulama and the people in parliament. We are part of the decision-making process. Traditional scholars said, you can't, what are you doing? This, wait, 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 hang on a minute. Obey Allah, obey the messenger and those in authority. That's very clear. That's for the Khalifa and Khalifa alone. This becomes institutionalized as the idea of the constitution. Okay, of the constitution comes back and the idea of the constitution is to hold the Khalifa to account so that if he did anything, we have a document that says that and this is the verse in the Quran. A shift took place okay, in this context. It's very unique how this operates. 
All right. I wanted to show you one of the flags. Flags are really interesting because in Turkey, the flag is sacred, um, which is intriguing. How does a flag become sacred in accordance to Islam? How does Islam make a, something like this sacred? But what you see here, so it says Musawa, Hurriyat, Uhuwet, Adalet, and Ittihad. Right? And this is now you're starting to see a new formation where symbols, physical symbols, became a reflection of the mantra. Right? And you have flags, you have coins, you have badges, you have postcards. And in 1909, they put the face of Mehmed Rashad, a sultan, on the flag. Because the sultan is caliph, so he's sacred, the flag is sacred, it can work. The only other time it's happened in Turkey's history is now we see it with uh, Mustafa Kemal's face has gone onto the flag. And some people put other one's face on the flag. So it's quite, quite, I might, might get into trouble with that one. All right. Well, we can delete that out. No, I'm just joking this way. If you find me in a body bag, you know what happened. It's the chemists. They came after me. <laughs> so this is a delegation. Uh, this is an interesting picture because this is a picture that shows that this was a delegation that tried to remove Sultan Abdul Hamid from power. Actually, this photograph is a fake. Um, this was an idea to construct an idea of a delegation removing. There were people that went to Sultan Abdul Hamid, but this picture was used to create a painting. I couldn't get the photograph of the painting that's in Istanbul, and I'm sorry about that. So this guy here, can you see him? It's like he's, got a, he's gonna pull out a gun, right? It's really fascinating. When you see the real photo, there's Abdul Hamid with his hands in his pocket like this. Abdul Hamid never put his hands in his pocket. Never put his hands in his pocket. So these images, these photographs, these paintings were constructing an idea in the minds of people of what we did and how we removed the Sultan in this context. And so you can see this, this imagination. You see that? Um, Abdul Hamid looking scared, people coming over, and, and so forth. There are um, enough information that Abdul Hamid was worried because he was concerned that he would be killed. People keep asking me, why did sultans get murdered and so forth? Because one of the problems they had is if a sultan still remained in existence and there was another sultan, there would be an army that could be supportive of him that could come back. And so they had a real issue with this idea of what do we do? So usually in Islamic history, if you see a sultan remains in power until he dies, then he's gone and a new one comes, right? And you have this same thing in the monarchy to some degree. But here, Abdul Hamid wasn't killed, actually. They sent him to Salonika instead out of Istanbul so that he couldn't gather an army um, to start off what they would call a counter-revolution. And it's a little bit interesting because when he was in Salonika, that's when we start to get a lot of information about Abdul Hamid. At the time, a lot of propaganda was being spread on him, but some individual accounts explain about how he was still pious, still religious, and so forth. And Abdul Habib was really concerned about World War I when they asked him about how could we have got out of World War I. He said, if, firstly, we should never have got involved in World War I. Yeah, first, he was still alive in World War I. He died in 1918. Okay. Um, but he said, if we were to get involved in World War I, you should have stayed on the side of the British, the British never lose. Right? But they didn't, then they came to, how do we get out? He goes, we can't, it's too late now. We're just going to have to see what happens. And in 1918, I don't have the picture, I don't. When he passes away, it's really fascinating. The people that deposed him from power felt so guilty that they were part of the procession. Some of them even held his coffin. They were, they were like, <clears throat> what did we do there? And the intriguing thing is, is, the point I'm trying to make to you is the, the complexity of politics. The issue here is not about good Muslim, good Khalifa, bad ulama, bad people. What you're seeing is the complexity of what we call Muslim contestations for power. It's really intriguing. In terms of here, it's no good or bad, but even in the period where something is quite prominent, that you're still going to have pieces moving. The balance of power is not like a pen like that. The balance of power is constant people shifting and moving. And it's never static. And we can see this throughout Islamic history that the same thing happens. Okay, so there. That was um, Abdul Hamid II. So I'm going to keep at that. Q&A, you can go as crazy as you want in the Q&A. Um, because actually, I, I, could, I teach a whole course on this. So I've tried to give it to you in, a, in, in an hour. But actually, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole semester on Abdul Hamid. There's, um, because he's in power for 33 years. There's a lot going on. But I try to keep the key points. So thank you very much. And we'll leave it to Q&A.